Okay, thanks, participants. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Associate Professor Julie Fleming. Uh, I'm on the executive for uh, ODLA, which is the Open Distance Learning Association of Australia. We've got a um, number of lovely faces, smiley faces this morning, very early in Australia. Um, so very pleased to have you along uh, to launch this special issue of the um, Distance Education Journal on Open Educational Practices. I won't go into the presenters, I'll leave that to Song. But I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, one of our colleagues who has passed away this week, Dr. Marcus Derig, um, passed suddenly this week. Uh, it was all a shock to some of the colleagues that may know him on, online. And if we wouldn't mind just um, giving him a minute's silence in respect uh, to Marcus. Okay, thanks everybody for that. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to hand over to Song to do the introductions for our uh, special discussion this morning. Thank you, Song. Thank you, Julie. Good morning, everyone from this part of the world. Uh, it might be good night or uh, good evening for wherever you are. Uh, I'm so excited about this event because this is the first time that that Odler is doing uh, a webinar or hosting a webinar that is around uh, one of the issues of the journal. Uh, the idea uh, for doing this came about in the last uh, AGM, <coughs> which we held recently, um, and there were um, <coughs> calls for some ideas as to what we might want to do, and I uh, suggested at the risk of taking on more work uh, uh, to, um, to have a, a webinar or a seminar around, uh, around issues of the, of the journal as they got published, because when you think about it, so much work goes into the publication. It would be quite um, normal. It would be quite, uh, well, it would be somewhat unwise to just leave it like that and not, not make the most of the opportunity. So the, the idea <coughs> for, for doing these kinds of things came about as a result of that call, which was, uh, uh, appreciated by the other uh, that volume 41 issue number two which is what it is is now published and is also open access till the end of July through the courtesy of the publishers uh, the publishers are always uh, hesitant to do this kind of thing but since the topic of this special issue is open educational practices <clears throat> I made a strong case to them to say you couldn't keep it under rep. You've got to keep it open. So they were pleased to keep it open for a little while. Um, so I'm going to now hand it over to Susan and Iris and Leo to talk more about the 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 content of the of the issue and how they uh, proceeded to put it together. Susan, over to you. Thank you, Sam. Um, I'm going to share the slides now because I'm not sure if Leo can do it. So if you could just bear with me, please. And let's see if this will work for you. Are you able to see my slides now? That's great, Suzanne. Okay, that's great. So I'm just going to go into the uh, event present. Yes, I was. I was just about to say you can make it full screen. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay, really excited about this. Um, thank you so much, Som, for giving us this opportunity. Really appreciate it. And also thank you for all your efforts and support and mentoring and um, for making sure that the issue is open access, at least for a while, because so many people were asking about this. And I think, um, um, you know, the issue justifies uh, that it, it could be open access for, you know, you know for a bit, you know, <laughs> if not always. Um, anyways, okay, so thank you so much, Som. Um, we also would like to thank Antonina um, Petrolito, the Distance Education um, Journal's copy editing editor for her really careful work. Um, and we'd like to thank all of our authors, um, you can see them all on screen now, um, for their excellent contributions, um, for asking really difficult questions on, on open educational practices. So we're really happy and we have this whole issue ready now. So um, we can't wait to share it with, uh, with everyone. So with the special issue, we wanted to attract um, scholars who had 
something to say about OEP from a critical perspective. And we wanted to move the field um, forward a little bit, um, push the current conversations towards a more um, broad understanding of OEP. Um, we also wanted to challenge the view that OEP is just about five R's. Um, or that is inherently um, collaborative practice. So going into this issue, we had a very broad, um, open-minded understanding um, of OEP, what open practice could be. Um, so open practice can be a lot of things. Um, I don't want to go too much into this because our author will talk about this open pedagogy, um, you know, inclusive open education, social annotation, there's so many different ways um, of framing, framing open, open um, practice. Um, I just wanted to talk about two, two incidents, seemingly disconnected incidents that have shaken my part of the world, um, um, UK and also the world as well, but you know, I'm talking from my perspective. Um, the spread of COVID-19 and the killing of George Floyd and the protests following his murder. So George Floyd's murder is a direct outcome of inequality and injustice. And COVID-19 surfaced the inequalities um, in the society, at least in the UK, um, like unstable living conditions, the massive difference between the rich and the poor in terms of living standards. And if we think about these events, what role could open educational practices play in response to things like COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, how can open educational practices contribute to equality, equity um, in online blended and traditional on-campus education? Um, and what role does theory play? You know, how can we better connect to practice? So these are big questions, um, but they're critical questions. And I think um, I, I had this on, on our slide here, <laughs> sorry, third slide. Um, when we start asking critical questions, we end up with having more critical questions. Um, and I think today we really need to listen to our contributors very carefully because they all have something to say about what role can OEP have in education and beyond. So we have this, this criticality in this issue. Um, so with that said, I'd like to keep it short and I'll hand it over to Aras, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank all uh, authors who contributed to this special issue. And I would like to song for the opportunity and for calling me a young man. You know, he really made me happy. Um, today, I want to talk about two things. The first one is origin and key motive of OEP, and the second one is unwitting and unintentional OEP. Uh, let's start with history and origin of, of, of OEP. I have some questions. Please think about these questions for a second, and I will then briefly provide some personal thoughts. Uh, what do we know about the original origin and history of education? What is the essence of education in earlier primitive forms? What was the core idea and core educational practice before the invention of writing? And why people invented writing? Why it is thought that open education can be a trace back to correspondence education, it was already available in uh, unstructured, unwritten, and unvisible forms. For instance, before settled life, we were nomadic people. Nomads were wandering around places to find resources uh, and to survive. Um, they were moving around groups and sharing tools, crafts, experience, and knowledge. During these times, storytelling was vital for them because they were then able to transmit their cultural uh, accumulation, knowledge, and observations from one generation to another one. In this perspective, songs, ballads, stories, and tales were uh, first type of soft educational technologies invented by the human that is used for teaching and learning. The main purpose of these practices had survival aims and universal values. They were freely available and accessible to everyone. Um, the invention of writing changed the course apart from uh, earlier cave drawings and hard education technology. Still in, in its primitive forms, uh, 
were clay, ta uh, clay table, uh, tablets, uh, parchment papers, reed and ink pens. After a long while, the printing machine was absolutely a disruptive innovation and the knowledge accumulation was greater than ever, which lasted until this knowledge, now, uh, knowledge age. The question of the day, here it comes, why did we invent writing? Because we want to share knowledge and experience. And I argue that sharing is the core value of OEP. We therefore refer to Nusemre's saying at the beginning of, our, uh, beginning of our editorial, what you share is yours, not what you gather. In brief, from nomads to settled humans, there were many facets of teaching and learning from primitive to uh, traditional way of teaching and learning. OEP emerged as a carving pictures to co cave walls, storytelling, writing on blogs in public open places to share the knowledge. OEP have existed much before in its digital form, as we know. Sharing is really caring, and from this perspective, I argue that OEP is strongly linked to pedagogy of care. Now let's keep on uh, talking uh, about unwitting and unintentional OEP. During COVID-19 pandemic, openness related in, uh, initiatives proved their values and played really important roles uh, uh, in, uh, in the practice of emergency uh, remote education. While it is commonly argued that OEP equals to OER, and OEP can be defined through, uh, let's say, why this five hours. I argue that these terms hinders and shadow uh, the real potential and uh, value of OEP. During the COVID-19 crisis, sharing was a key act, and we witnessed that uh, we witnessed the importance of openness in education, and we truly understood why we need uh, open education and its derivations. We also observed many efforts ignoring licensing requirements and uh, pre theorizing sharing and caring motives. There were many OEP which were unwitting and unintentional. People were sharing because they were caring each other. And I conclude that we have to keep sharing and explore different dimensions of OEP from the perspective of unwitting and unintentional OEP. So is Leo here? So because I will give the mic to him. Hello, I'm here. Um, I haven't got my camera on in case of, um, in case my bandwidth is um, degrading my audio. So I hope you can hear me okay. Um, thank you, um, Su Suzanne and Aris. Um, and um, I just wanted to continue with the a few um, a few introductory points of my own as well, um, and really, I was so delighted to be invited to be part of this guest editorial team um, because i 've been thinking about OEP for quite a few years now, and really, I came to it via um, OER research, and I noticed that at the time a few years ago, a lot more OER researchers were talking a lot more about practices. Um, and it seemed that there was a recognition that resources, however desirable and valuable they are, uh, are not actually creating themselves, sharing themselves. Um, they're not reusing, repurposing, um, or learning or teaching on their own. And, uh, and so there was um, starting to be this turn towards thinking about practices. And this idea that open education as a kind of a field or as a movement was kind of quite intensely focused on resources alone um, seemed to be um, seemed to be quite problematic. Um, there, there was quite a lot of discussion of a prehistory of OER, which was locating uh, the, the sort of the history of the idea of um, opening resources in um, open source software and maybe in um, kind of open access to research publications. And, um, and I, I found it strange that less so the the history um, of open education was being kind of found in open educate in, in education itself, for example, in open universities or open and distance learning. 
And uh, as I thought more about the idea of practices being open, I realized that to make a claim for practices as open isn't the same kind of claim that we might make about open resources. So for resources openly licensed, it's fairly straightforward and verifiable that you can go, yeah, okay, that's open. But when we start talking about practices being open, it's clear that this could mean all kinds of things that could be open in all kinds of ways. Um, and there isn't going to be one correct version of openness in that context. It's a contextual and relative kind of claim rather than a, a total or final state. And um, so in this sense, I realized that the institution that I was working in, um, Birkbeck University of London at the time, um, was actually doing open education without talking about the term open education, without thinking of itself as an open university, because, um, because Birkbeck's um, mission for uh, almost 200 years now has been to teach um, higher education in the evening for students who are um, working during the day and can only um, come to attend face-to-face -face education um, after working, you know, kind of business hours. So, um, so isn't this in fact a form of open university, but just rather unlike what we think of because we've come to think that openness is all about digital and is all about licenses. Um, and, um, and so that, that, um, that led me to think uh, much more about how the, the turn to practices and in kind of creating this idea of practices open, always being the openness, always being something that's unstable and something that's provisional and that's only explained within the specific context is actually a, a call to, to us to be more, more critical and more investigative in our, in our research. Um, into open practices. Uh, so in that sense, I feel like the, the concept of OEP actually begins to be a critical lens on practice that asks us to think about um, in what sense is this open? What is being opened? How, why, and to whom? And what I think is wonderful about this set of um, articles in, the, in this issue of the journal is that um, all the authors have really um, looked at that across this range of uh, fantastically varied um, but all very interesting contexts and for that um, I, I really thank them and that's it for me. Okay thank you very much Leo. I think next is Taskin. Oh. Sorry. Okay. okay. Good morning and <laughs> good evening everyone. Um, so first, I just want to really thank um, Ara, Suzanne, and Leo um, for putting this um, special edition um, to get, uh, together. Um, this is one of the first papers that I've published, and the publishing process can be extremely daunting. But um, with them, they made it highly collaborative and highly open, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so going forward, um, yeah, my, my paper is titled Open Educational Practices of MOOC Designers, Embodiment and Epistemic Location. And um, this paper was part of, or uh, well, the study was part of my bigger research um, uh, for my PhD, basically focusing on addressing injustices through MOOC. And um, before I jump into it, I just want to locate this paper within the current context, within two movements, or two moments rather. And I think Suzanne um, drew on one of them already, and that's the current Black Lives um, Matter um, protests. And um, yeah, um, basically, I think this paper links so strongly with the current movement right now, and just highlighting the historic and present day atrocities against um, black people and black bodies. Um, this paper really links, when, links to that when it talks about embodiment and the experiences that people face um, due to um, their location or gender or language or sexuality. Um, the second moment that I wanted to draw on um, is that actually since it's past midnight for me, it's now the 16th of June in South Africa and that is um, Youth Day in South Africa, and um, it's a day to remember and commemorate the Soweto uprising where hundreds of um, black high school learners um, were murdered by police, and these students were protesting for, um, basically protesting against um, the 
the media market instruction being um, changed to Afrikaans in, in times of apartheid. So I think really um, this really connects to the themes in this article. Um, so yes, the study basically illustrates that um, it highlights the lack of epistemic diversity in the designers of MOOCs. And it illustrates that um, MOOC designers actually create MOOCs that strongly link to who they are, what they value, and how they understand the world. And so it's really crucial to have epistemically diverse MOOC designers from different cultures, from different value systems, from different epistemologies that critically reflect on their positionalities and subjectivities. And so just moving on to the next slide. Um, basically, um, my paper started off highlighting, um, yeah, you can move on to the next slide, Suzanne, thanks. Um, yeah, so basically um, my paper started off highlighting the dominance of um, repositories of OER from uh, the global north. And I normally cite uh, Santa Formosa here, yeah, and so it's nice that Gemma is in the audience today and I can actually see someone that I cite so often to highlight this point. Um, basically, I draw on concepts of embodiment from cognitive sciences, decolonial thought, feminist standpoint theory, and critical pedagogy. Basically, embodiment talks about the connection between the mind and the body, and that means between knowledge and the knower. And so knowledge is not just neutral, but that it's strongly connected to who the knower is and the experiences, the languages, the, cult the cultures that that um, knower brings. So basically, um, I, uh, in my paper, I unpack conceptions of openness through four categories, um, personal background, academic background, life experiences, and political inclination. And I showed um, how, um, MOOC designers' um, views and subjectivity strongly impacted their understanding of openness. And basically, the, the paper had two major conclusions. The first one was that um, MOOC designers uh, is, is to shift the idea of thinking uh, of MOOC designers as creators of OER and implementers of o OEP, but rather um, to think of them rather as embodiment of openness in themselves. So shifting it from something extrinsic to something intrinsic. And the second um, um, conclusion was that uh, we really need MOOC designers from epistemically diverse backgrounds um, to basically challenge the dominance of Western-centric epistemologies in MOOCs. And this is to prevent something I call the digital epistemicide, which is basically the systematic oppression of marginalized knowledge through digital means. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Um, thank you. And I, I hope you enjoy reading the paper. Thank you so much, Taskeen. Um, quick question. Um, when, I, when I share my screen, are you able to see, like, I open the chat window. <laughs> are you able to see that or just the presentation slides? Um, no. I can see it, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I, okay wasn't, just... I wasn't concentrating on it, but yes, I can see it. Okay. Thank you. So um, next is Sharonika and Storm together. Yeah. Okay. Um, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, okay, so um, I'm also very happy to be given this opportunity to share some thoughts uh, on our paper, uh, ascertaining impacts of capacity building on, uh, in open education practices, which is authored by me and Som. Uh, this is based on um, an initiative uh, we implemented at the Open Institute of Sri Lanka, where I come from. Uh, and it's a, um, actually a capacity building process or a continuing professional development uh, program for practitioners uh, on integrating OER and adoption of OEP uh, into their professional practices. Uh, okay, so. Uh, let me uh, start with this quote uh, that is the starting sentence uh, in our paper. I think that's what we all been, believe and uh, everybody has been talking about this. Uh, the adoption of OEP requires a shift in our perceptions, perspectives and practices about learning and teaching toward a more participatory, creative and a sharing culture. 
So that's the premise we are in. I mean, we, are, we all believe in that. Um, so uh, we, uh, that's what we have attempted in our initiative, um, how to facilitate such shift uh, in mindsets and practices uh, among individuals or in this case, practitioners. So uh, if you move on to the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so if uh, adoption of OEP requires changes in thinking uh, and practices and belief systems, uh, the first question is how or can we facilitate such changes? So we believe, yes, this can be uh, accomplished uh, by, a, by carefully designed learning experiences and engaging individuals uh, sus sustaining such uh, carefully designed learning experiences, which is what we have attempted uh, in our uh, professional development program or the capacity development program, which is a, which uh, constitute of a series of MOOCs uh, in the form of MOOCs, uh, which were on adopting OER and OEP, uh, where the practitioners were situated in authentic learning sit, uh, situations. They were placed in authentic learning situations and uh, to engage in a series of uh, learning activities and facing real life issues in related to OER and OEP and allowing them to uh, solve these issues by engaging in this learning experience and reflect on those issues on how to solve these problems. So that's basically a summary of uh, what we have done. But the question is, um, how, okay, how to ascertain the impacts of such capacity development? The focus of our paper here is how to ascertain impacts of such capacity development uh, of such a, uh, such, a, such a carefully designed experience. This is not easy because uh, it's an outcome of a combination of factors which involve the practitioners themselves, their context, and their mindsets. Even though we have very carefully orchestrated and designed, developed, implemented, and evaluated the whole thing, so how do we really know uh, such changes have happened and how to ascertain the impact. So in this paper, we discuss our approach to shifting the mindsets of practitioners around OEP and ascertaining its impact on them. So uh, the, this uh, approach took a design, this was a design-based research approach. So we have designed this intervention and throughout the process, uh, the design, uh, the, it was um, through a collection of multiple sets of data, we tried to ascertain the impact of these design features, how it had impacted on shifting the mindset of practitioners around OEP and OER. So our main uh, thing, uh, main focus was to ascertain the impacts in terms of ways in which and the extent to which the thinking and practices of practitioners had changed towards openness as a result of engaging in the design learning experiences. So the findings, the data collected through a multiple variety of sources and the finding, we used the findings to discuss this impact and uh, I invite you all to uh, go through our paper uh, and we, we share of uh, what we have found uh, and we would be very happy to uh, get any comments, feedback on our attempt. Thank you. So I think it's my, my turn to so the previous slide, yes. And start, yes, just start uh, yes. by thanking, uh, thanking the, the editors uh, for these uh, two good initiatives. The first one uh, being the, the special issue itself and the 
uh, ongoing support we had through this process uh, for uh, arriving to a good, uh, a good uh, product as a whole. And the other one is, is the organization of the webinar. I'm Marcelo Maina. I'm from the Open University of Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain. And I'm a co-author of this article, Open Educational Practices in the Design of Digital Competence Assessment. My co-authors, two of them are present right now, listening to all of us, that are uh, Lourdes Guardia, uh, also from Universidad Oberta de Catalunya, Shema Santos, also from uh, University of, of Barcelona, and uh, Federica Mancini. Uh, the first challenge we had for this webinar was to find a short sentence that summarizes uh, our uh, paper. And I thought it would be um, an enterprise I would not be able to, uh, to respond to. But uh, fortunately, just reading again and again <laughs> our paper, I think this uh, uh, idea that I highlight in these uh, almost four lines um, summarizes uh, what we present in this article. Our study contributes to K-12 open educational practices by providing a documented bottom-up initiative which promotes teachers' adoption of collaborative design practices that becoming open educators in the process. So we can move to the next slide, please, Susan. Uh, let me uh, tell you just a few words about the context of this uh, research. This is part of an Horizon 2020 project, uh, which aim uh, was, because it's just ended a few months ago, um, was to find ways in, uh, to support uh, teachers uh, in uh, developing and uh, helping their students develop the digital competence. This is a concern in Europe, a particular one, and uh, being able to assess that in a rigorous way and certify it. Uh, for doing so, we, do, we uh, started uh, with two big uh, um, uh, challenges. First of, all, first of all was uh, to develop what we call an operational concept for the digital competence because we um, adopted uh, the digital uh, competence framework in Europe for citizens that is a quite comprehensive one. Uh, just to mention that it has, uh, I remember well, uh, uh, around 21 sub-competencies in this um, framework. And we also analyzed other uh, seven uh, European um, digital competence uh, frameworks or schemes as applied by uh, educational systems. Uh, doing that, we uh, end with an, um, an adapted version of the DigCom in, uh, to the K-12 uh, level. And the second challenge was to develop a competence assessment model in order to also um, uh, uh, design a situation where this digital competence could be um, implemented and assessed by uh, teachers. We did it, uh, that by developing some new concepts like competency assessment scenarios that are kind of complex activities where digital competence can be developed over time. So in this uh, paper in particular, we were very interested in seeing how teachers as co-designers and co-participants of all these three years um, uh, project uh, the, uh, through uh, um, an approach of open educational practices uh, could actually uh, develop themselves. Uh, let's first hypothesis about teacher development, adopt uh, the open education uh, paradigm and uh, share their uh, designs with others. So we applied a design-based research approach uh, in three phases, but they were incremental. The first one was uh, with uh, six uh, teams uh, distributed in, in the countries that were uh, participating in the project. First of all, were teams uh, belonging to uh, a specific country. The second phase, I will go very fast in this, uh, was to involve these teachers in training other ones in a three days workshop in Italy, where 44 other teachers uh, used and reused these competence assessment scenarios and adapted to their own context. And they also practiced their implementation in an, a prototype platform that was also an objective of this project, develop a, a tailor-made platform for uh, digital competence assessment. Um, uh, after these two phases, the also develop a design toolkit that support teachers in doing that. They co-participate in the 
uh, adjustment and improvement of this design uh, toolkit. They share their um, competence assessment scenarios understood as OER, if you want, to the world. So in the third phase, uh, we uh, develop a MOOC based on these competence and assessment scenarios and the design uh, toolkit, and uh, we open that to the world, particularly with the intention to involve uh, teachers from uh, Europe um, to participate in the pilot, the final pilot of the project. So uh, through the MOOC, we gain a lot of attention and uh, we have um, been able to engage around 400 teachers and more than 1,400 students. And uh, through this process of implementation of digital competence assessment and certification in their schools, this also develop and reuse and localize and translate competence assessment scenarios to their own uh, context. So as you see, we studied that um, also from the lens of the Open Education Factory Framework that let us identify four kind of practices, open practices uh, of teachers related to design, as I mentioned before, to teaching in terms of uh, innovation that we're applying in terms of methodologies, also in terms of assessment, uh, innovation in terms of assessment, and of course the production of OER. And this framework is um, um, quite useful because it lets us understand not only these four kind of practices that we analyze through this lens, but also uh, trace the evolution of, in practices of uh, our uh, teachers involved in the, in the project. So um, to conclude, I would say that um, we have two claims here that I hope um, if you go to the um, uh, paper, you can agree with that, that we've uh, been able to provide evidence, I wouldn't say prove, but to provide evidence in order to um, claim that open educational practices may foster teacher development through joint actions and the open educational practices may have themselves an amplifier effect of generating far, further open educational practices. So thank you very much. I think I took my camera, <laughs> have an abuse of that. Thank you, um, Marcelo. Sorry, I'm very bad at moving through the slides. It's whenever I click on my screen, something else happens. I was just wondering, we've listened from Taski and Sharonika and Marcelo, um, if you have any questions for, for, um, uh, for them. Should we move forward? Okay, okay. So our next uh, presenter, um, Helen, Helen, right? Um, please correct me if I'm saying. Yeah. That's good. Thank you very much, um, Suzanne, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, present this article that I co-authored um, with uh, one of my colleagues, Agnes uh, Kukolska-Hume. Um, my start point for tonight would be uh, a couple of points that um, stand out for me from the editorial that uh, the three guest editors wrote uh, in Critical Questions for Open Educational Practices. And these are the two following points that attracted me. Um, the first one is OER should be better understood as a multidimensional and interdisciplinary construct that encompasses a diverse range of opening practices. And the second point is that um, yet exactly what makes a practice open or closed remains an open question. Its answers multiple and provisional. So I think I wanted to uh, raise these two points because it connects with my conclusion. Um, so in my educational context, uh, the Department of Modern Languages at the Open University UK, um, teachers tutor on a variety of languages at different levels online and at a distance and to achieve their teaching goals um, most teachers use digital materials that have been uh, created and stored in a repository of digital materials specifically for online language teaching um, as one of the founders of the repository and author of many of its resources, 
myself. Um, I've always been keen to find out what teachers did with these materials. Um, that these materials they were developed um, specifically for for them and for for their classes, but most importantly, um, I was interested in whether the reuse of our materials impacted on their teaching practices. So very early on, I wanted to investigate what was going on with the practices of using OER rather than the creation of, of OER. And that's why I started uh, an investigation uh, through a, a thesis. Um, to answer my question was, uh, how does OER reuse impact on online language teaching practices? So that was my start point. So um, I carried out a study with uh, 17 online language teachers uh, using a, a grounded theory methodology. Um, and I go straight to the results. And I found that teachers find inspiration while they browse through uh, resources. Um, they always reappropriate the materials to make to make it their own. They reflect a great deal on their teaching method, their own teaching methodologies, why they uh, adapt. Um, they learn and develop in many different ways. However, they do not share their own resources or the ones that they have craftily adapted uh, for their own audiences. They only share with students through their tutorials, obviously, and they share with colleagues they know or they trust. Um, ultimately, um, I found that teachers reuse OER and develop new practices for teaching languages online to enrich their students' learning experience. Um, rather than to advance their own um, um, career. Um, and sharing in a public space, such as an online repository, is, is, not es is not essential for an open university language teacher, because sharing resources with other colleagues from, from the sector is not part of students' progress or performance, which is what motivates and satisfies teachers. So these findings, of course, are not new. Uh, they tally with what mm, a number of other researchers have found in, in other contexts and other disciplines, um, in that teachers overall use and adapt resources, but they do not share their own resources widely. Therefore, in the literature, it has been um, written um, a lot about the fact that OER movement uh, has not reached uh, its expectations and educators have concerns with regards to the sustainability of the movement. Um, so, okay, findings not, not, not entirely new. However, where my research, I think, is important in the context of this special issue is that it shows that if we um, look at practices in the context of the teaching languages online and at a distance, the use of OER has enabled teachers to improve or learn all sorts of teaching techniques. Uh, but also, it has, in some cases, open teachers' minds to different practices, to different techniques. So, for example, in the, in the, the resources that the, my research participants displayed during the interviews, it was clear that um, reusing colleagues' resources uh, was helping some language teachers to become more considerate with what they put on screens, for example, or it helped them to become more open to different um, practices about uh, teaching languages online, 
or it helped them to be more aware of the questions of diversity and, and inclusivity that you have to observe online. And it has helped them to create resources that are a much better fit to suit the wide range of students that we have um, at the OU. So teachers use, adapt, repurpose, recreate wonderful resources um, that make their practices much more open and much more inclusive and much more participatory than before. However, as they do not share those resources back online in, in public spaces like an a repository, for example, these new practices remain, invi remain invisible. And so that's why I reached my conclusion, which I think is my critical contribution to this special issue. And it's the question, do inclusive participatory and diverse educational practices need to be digital to be open? And in a context like the OU, which is so conducive to sharing openly, and as the re my research shows, where practices have become really open to students' diverse needs, why, one might wonder why its, it's teachers do not engage in sharing publicly. And um, during the um, COVID-19 crisis, the OU has shared many, in many different ways how to you know, shift to online and remote teaching. And our teachers' open practices have been at the heart of this teaching model that we've shared and promoted. So I, I hope that these open practices are going to be more visible, even if they're not visible in a public open repository. And that's that for me. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Helen. That's really interesting. Um, any questions for, um, um, for our contributor? Yes, Aras, is that you? Or are you just clapping? You're just clapping, right? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, so next um, is, oh, OK, I'm going to, by the end of the uh, webinar, I think I'll know how to switch slides. Um, is this the right slide? Uh, can you go back one, please? Oh, one uh, back. Okay, sorry. I think when I great. click on the screen, it's automatically okay. Yeah. All right, lovely. Um, yeah, um, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Kangmin Lee from Lancaster University in UK. Um, and I totally agree with all this multiplicity of online um, open education practices. But my paper tried to really narrow focus down to see the impact. So from, uh, I start from a little bit different kind of perspective from some of um, the present, uh, presenters that we have here. In a way that I, uh, my standing point is that only way for us to understand the, truly understand the, understand the impact of our online education or open educational practice is to look at the very small population that we think that we're serving or we have been talking that we've been, we've been serving and to see how we're actually serving them more with a very narrow lens. Um, because it's very concerning that now it seems like everyone is talking about open education. Everyone is like in one way or the other is doing that. It's nothing to do, uh, nothing wrong with everyone is doing that, but like so many people are doing and talking about it. Actually, we often feel like since it's always everywhere, we feel like things are so much more open than before. And then it's less clear who is actually doing what and for whom. So, I mean, it was very timely call that I was excited because this has been my kind of scholarly interest for the past five or six years. So when the call came out, uh, I really decided to, I decided to ask a very simple question, but try to really find the evidence from the scholarly literature uh, by asking simple question like who actually opens in particular online education to whom and for what. So I'm going to kind of briefly uh, talk about the findings I got from doing critical literature review um, using some grounded theory approach. Thank you, uh, Sujan. Can you go? 
Can we move to, yeah. So basically, uh, the first question was apparently we have to know who is actually opening online higher education. It has been like around as a discourse for some time, um, but it's not very clear who is actually doing it. And um, I looked at 29 papers, all kind of really having specific focus on online education. And then they call themselves as open university or traditional university, but doing opening and trying to open the online education to some people. So uh, in those 29 papers, all those 29 papers says basically um, it's university. So one way or the other, when the universities are opening the doors to population. And then when I read it more carefully, when I tried to do second round of coding, and then it was not really university because like people can ask what university really means. University is not the simple thing. It's like kind of composing, it's like consisting of a lot of different peoples with different agenda. So when I look at it, it was more of a few, very small number possibly, enthusiastic you know, uh, who are like us, maybe sharing the spirit of openness in those um, universities and trying to do a good thing in their little, pra uh, little tra teaching practice. So it was a small number of faculty members who was trying to really share their knowledge. And then that was asked to, I mean, it was asked for them to share it anyway. And then there has been a lot of uh, discussion about what kind of technology. So it looks like uh, on surface level list, it's the universities and then faculty members and some tools, technologies are opening. They're like very kind of big opening actors. And then a lot of paper didn't really say much about supporting actors, but a couple of very good paper written a lot about how, although those three kind of actors are highlighted as the main actors, a couple of paper really highlighted this is all team effort. Because by, if, if we think about the quality of, or quality of the good quality um, open educational practice, actually one, faculty member can't really do it. So it's, it has a lot of team actually supporting that kind of practices, but often those teams are very silent in those papers published. So we don't really know those who are those teams and what kind of contribution they're making for this open educational practice. And secondly, and then I tried to look at the universities more closely. It's kind of interesting in a way that previously it was all kind of open university doing this job. And now it's more like traditional campus-based university trying to talk about their open practice. And then those traditional campus-based university in large number, they are quite a rep with a high reputation and they're talking a lot and also research intensive university that's why their members are publishing more than probably a teaching focused university so there are a lot of discussion about traditional campus-based university trying to open and but if you read try to read those paper actually what those different universities in terms of their types based on their types of university they have very different multiple agendas and practices so it's very difficult for us to measure the specific impact of those practices upon certain group of, group of population so we can move to next question um, Thank you. So yeah, that's of course that the, a lot of universities doing something very nice and they reporting good um, good coverage and very positive outcome, whether they do qualitative study or quantitative study. So of course, next question is for whom do they do it? Um, and then this is very dis disappointing, personally very disappointing result that because my focus was really trying to figure out who are the potentially disadvantaged learners that we've been thinking that we've been helping. Um, I just wanted to find the evidence that we're doing that something for them. But of course, it was not very clear because a lot of, a lot of papers talk about a very massive number. It was like 10, 20, um, 100,000 learners that have been kind of watching their videos, watching their um, iTunes. So they were there are a large number written there, but of course, as we can, it's not too difficult to imagine that, you know, it's very difficult to know who they are other than their gender, educational background, and we are all knowing already, we know that a lot of people are already having higher education degrees. Um, many, many articles are trying to have the criteria that 
if those people who approach and then who did the online education with them are outside the university, so a lot of university thinking that the, those participants are outside the university, they claim that it's very open practice because they give the opportunity to people who have them paid to them. However, as you, I mean, again, I will repeat myself, but those people are already having opportunity in their life from other university. And then it's kind of really unclear that how we can just say those people are particularly disadvantaged to get the opportunity for the first time from that kind of practice. And then when it comes to actual disadvantaged learner, there are a couple of paper really nicely. And I, I really, I'm saying that those paper made me really happy to read it. So there are good papers, a very specific target audience that they had, and they described those little small number of people's experience doing the OER, uh, OEP with them. And that was great. But majority of the papers are assuming that there are a lot of people out there especially in African countries, although it was one of the, mass, uh, the large number of papers citing they're serving African students in Africa, which doesn't have much um, access to educational opportunity, but it's very unclear that who they are and then even number in when it comes to African context was not listed there. So it seems like a lot of people thinking they're serving disadvantaged students somewhere out there without giving much of the evidence. So the last, question that I asked was the, uh, so what is a proposed that a list in the paper people are saying in terms of, uh, Susan, can we go back, I uh, go forward, please. Oh, that's great. So um, yeah, of course, there are a lot of discussions, all those 29 paper talking about openness in very, very, in a common way, as we all talk here, that uh, a lot of statements were written there that they're really helping underserved students and so on and but as you can see that there are here and there we can find a lot uh, we, I can find the statements about statistic uh, no strategic and reputational motives that why this big university trying to open up and try to put their lectures online and then behind the story that uh, it's quite you know, they they have their agenda, which is not necessarily always about purely open uh, openness agenda. And then there was one quote that I find from one of the paper. It was really hitting me and telling me what's going on about this top university. It says the author says the universities are under very significant pressure because now everyone really want them to be opening the participation, the widening the participation is like really popular top down and then they have a lot of social pressure on it. So they try to do it, but they are not necessarily wanting to spend a lot of money on it. So the best way for them to do it is to make MOOCs and make their lectures available online. And then that's really cost effective enactment of this top down policies of, and that they can go away from the pressure um, so and then so a conclusion is for this question is all this opening statements and positive potential of OEP really cover the hidden kind of agenda um, which may be more stronger than the pure agenda that we think that we're doing. So last conclusion is so I think this is really problematic that I kept coming across this phrase that education for all and then when it comes like everyone's life matter I mean I kind of hit this and I feel like that was what I was trying to say in my paper but it's like as, as we try to do things for everyone it's it's very easy for us to lose our focus at least some of us should remain uh, and stick to our original focus that we serve the people who haven't had opportunity so we have to go back to back to basic and rather than having rhetorical claims about what we are doing, we have to focus on actual situation uh, that uh, looking at those people's experiences and then intentions are always very good. So nothing wrong with it, but we may need to put more effort to uh, measure the impact of our an outcome. And then rather than being so general about our practice, we may have to be very specific and that that may be the only way for us to get the satisfactory answers to the question like this. So thank you, that's me. Thank you so much. Um, 
I think that gave us uh, really good things to think about, like a lot of food for thought. <laughs> so um, if you have any questions, perhaps just raise a hand. I don't know how it would appear, but um, instead of me asking, just, just if you have any questions, just let everyone know. Thank you so much. Um, now our last, next um, speaker. Oh, Beck, okay. Hi, everybody. And, um... Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Leo and Aris um, and Som for uh, for the opportunity as well for our paper to appear in the special issue. I'm really excited and happy um, to be part of this issue. Really exciting and um, great to hear about um, some of the other papers um, that our paper is, is alongside in the special issue. So um, my name is Beck Pitt. I'm based at the Open University and I'm here to talk briefly about our paper on supporting open educational practices through open textbooks. Um, so this paper um, is uh, focused on some work we did as part of a project called UK Open Textbooks. Um, this project ran from 2017 to 2018. Um, it was funded by the Hewlett Foundation. So big thank you to um, Hewlett uh, for funding this work. Um, the main uh, focus of the project, um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we work with OpenStax and the Open Textbook Network um, to replicate um, uh, their models of um, increasing awareness and mainstreaming open textbooks within the North American um, context. So we ran workshops in the UK um, and also uh, displayed open, tax, open stacks textbooks um, at events, at science events. So we focused on um, STEM uh, books in particular as part of this work. And so it's very interesting going to these different events, um, hearing from educators who hadn't heard um, anything about OER, open textbooks, OEP, any of these things, um, and hearing from people about um, the excitement that was generated really around um, this type of resource and the type of opportunities um, that um, OER and OEP um, could offer. So that's a little bit of background about um, this project. Towards the end of the project, we carried out a survey. Um, and what we were looking to try and do was survey um, uh, HE educators um, in the UK um, about their use of textbooks to get a better understanding of what people were doing um, uh, and how people were using textbooks. There's not a huge amount of research out there um, it, within the UK context on student or educator um, uses of textbooks um, or um, uh, per uh, perceptions of textbooks um, compared within the US um, where obviously there's um, quite a large and growing body of research around um, use of open textbooks in particular um, and the impact that that's having. So this paper basically explores um, the findings of, of our survey. Um, we kind of start off looking at OEP and then kind of setting out a bit of the terrain. Um, so talking a bit about the role of open textbooks within the North American context in particular, before we kind of move to talk a bit more about the UK HE context um, and some of the background um, around that and some of the kind of specific um, uh, specifics. Um, so as I mentioned, there's not a huge amount of um, research out there. Um, Viv Rolf, um, uh, who also worked with us on UK Open Textbooks, has done some work with um, students at UWE um, around their, um, uh, how, how cost, for example, um, influences um, people's behaviour, um, the cost of textbooks and resources, and also around the role of reading lists um, within uh, UK HE study. So um, a lot of the time when you enrol, um, on a course, you'll get given a big uh, reading list, um, which you'll, um, which often it can be kind of difficult for students to um, prioritise what they need to uh, buy from from this from this list. So, what did we find out from our survey? Um, there's a number of different things. I think just to, for the purposes of um, uh, today, I'm just going to pick out a couple of things that um, we talk about in in there um, at the moment, and this with some of the research being carried out already in the UK context, there's still a fairly low um, uh, level of awareness of, um, of, of open textbooks um, and, and OER, although there's a number of, in our sample, um, there was a, a kind of, um, I think about half the number of people that, we, we, um, that responded to the survey have an awareness of CC licensing, even if they're not, um, aware of um, OER and open textbooks but there's great potential there and this was something that we found out from the other work I mentioned um, uh, where we were speaking to people and talking to them about um, 
OER and open textbooks is that the vast majority of people that we surveyed would consider using um, open textbooks in the future and would actually um, like to be involved um, in, for example, co-creating them. So there's quite a, um, an interesting insights that the survey um, gives both into um, current kind of use of textbooks, um, but also what the potential is um, kind of going forward. Um, so I think particularly in the recommendations, I think it kind of comes down to, again, as I mentioned, there's not a huge amount of research, there's definitely loads more um, to be done around that. But it kind of points to, as the quotation <laughs> that I've picked out here says, um, that you know there is this kind of fertile ground for open textbook adoption, um, and the potential of, of open textbooks to support OEP um, within the UK context. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. But thanks very much. Thank you so much, Beck. Okay, our next um, presenter is. Um, how do you say your name? <laughs> It, it's a Country. perennial problem, like Krohor. It's a tough one. Krohor, okay. We learned a bit of Irish from Krohor. Krohor, right? Yes, yeah, just a... Uh, okay. <laughs> and so, thanks so much, Susan. Um, it's always good to to kind of spread the language. It, it's part of what I'm going to be talking about, actually. Um, Irish is a minority language here, up, scattered on the west coast of Europe, um, on this little island. But... Um, I'd like to thank by, or I'd like to start, I should say, it's the late hour, by thanking yourself, Susan, Leo, and Aris as well, uh, and all the other speakers. It's been a fantastic special that you have to say. And um, one of the benefits of going towards the end is that you can actually see the links between your own work and the work actually of the co-presenters. And like a few of the other um, speakers, I found it kind of difficult to pick out a specific quote but I think this one is an important one, and I think it does weave through a lot of the themes we've been talking about tonight as well. Um, and in our case, it's about culture. So we talked here about culture battering, and culture is quite a dangerous word because it's a bit like one of those ones when you use it, identity, power. People ask, what exactly does it mean when you say culture? Um, but we were using actually a rather unique um, case study environment in a sense. So our Study was a MOOC, but it was an Irish language MOOC, an Irish language and culture MOOC. And um, Susan, if it might be possible to just move on to the next slide. Um, what's interesting about it, of course, is, as I said, um, Irish is a minority language. Um, and minority language speakers and learners in general are in a strange space, particularly, I think, um, I agree strongly with what Hyung Ming was saying. I think that that's a really important point about who when we talk about disadvantage, we have to say who is being disadvantaged and in what way. And an interesting thing that I think is present here is, and it's something that's shown through in our results, was this idea that really an intersectional idea when we're talking about this, because um, on the one hand, minority language speakers in the West, for example, might be considered you know, privileged or certainly in societies that might be quite wealthy or developed. But an interesting element is in another sense, um, something that I know myself and Mairead, my co-author, who is on the call as well, would know as Irish speakers is in many other ways, we're often disadvantaged. I mean, we're dealing with the kind of, in an English speaking world, we're a small minority of population. And something that we noticed when we were looking through a lot of these, I should give the context of the study itself, which is that we looked at about three and a half thousand comments from learners on the MOOCs, uh, on the MOOC itself. And we found really interesting um, themes and trends emerge, uh, I shouldn't say emerging, but we found interesting themes coming out of the data. And that a very common theme was this cultural humanistic purpose. So for many learners, I mean, it was remarkable how many would say it wasn't just about learning um, about a culture, it was learning a new way of being, it was learning a new way of speaking, it was so much more than a language. And what's interesting about that kind of um, learning in a sense, which we've tried to hint at throughout the paper, is that that learning to flip it from the learner's perspective is often kind of mercurial and we often find that it, it's not something that's necessarily supported or certainly when we look at open educational practices and the types of subjects that are catered for. An interesting element we noted was how languages are often actually pushed to the back of the queue and there are far fewer courses catering for languages and particularly for languages where there might be a large speech community. So, for example, if you go onto any MOOC platform, you'll see that there are plenty 
of MOOCs for French, German, for business purposes. So they're often even pitched in this sense, they're for functional business purposes. But there's far fewer um, for people who want to learn about a language, who want to learn about a culture and explore. And in many cases, as we um, discuss in our paper, an interesting element to a lot of heritage learners who want to reconnect and who see it as kind of regaining a side of themselves that perhaps they didn't feel that connected with before. So what all that kind of humanistic learning has in common, if we were treading it all together, is that it's difficult to quantify. It's quite an interesting um, tension in a sense. And this is why we note that OEPs in general, and then MOOCs more specifically, are very much potentially transformative. I mean, we can see it through all these papers, the themes that are running through all of them, is I think a fact uh, exploring the promise of technology, the fact that it is something that can really transform but it often doesn't. And I think that, again, this links back to many of our other speakers, but the fact um, that often we look at the functional utility and measurement to take a very central role when we're talking about these topics and these trends. Um, and then when I say here that not all learners are equal, this isn't meant in a judgmental sense, but what an interesting point is that we actually found, and I think this is a broader point about MOOC studies in general, was the remarkable, when we talk about the soul behind the screen as a phrase, what we're essentially talking about is the fact that the, um, the diversity that was visible actually between learners was remarkable. I mean, we had older learners, we had younger learners, we had learners who had learned Irish in school, we had learners who had never heard it before. And I think a specific challenge that that promotes is when it's that open, the question becomes, well, how do we actually forge cohesion? How do we forge a sense of purpose and belonging also? Um, and the last point that kind of emerge out, it emerges out of that also, um, to reiterate the central point, is I think a need to ask not simply what is being said, I mean, our words, but who is being heard? And I think that if what our paper has tried to emphasize is that intersectional element that when we're talking about OEP in general, and then MOOCs in specific. Um, we often have to keep that in mind, I think. And I think that what the special issue points to also, just as a final point, is the fact that there's a need for far more, I think, contextualized study that actually goes into specific courses, that looks at comments, that sees this kind of culture that's being built, because that's the culture in another sense, is the actual interactions, people getting to know each other and moving from course to course also. And um, so I think there's a need for a lot more study in this field also. Um, but as I say, we were absolutely thrilled to contribute to the special issue. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. So my final bit of Irish would be Gurmahagun, which means thank you very much. Thank you so much. I was wondering if um, your collaborators would like to join the conversation and say a few words. So, hi, this is Mairead here. Um, from a very darkly and dimly lit room as <laughs> in. Um, yeah, just I've been listening into some of the presentations there. I had my video off, but I was just listening intently. I think for us, this paper was really, really important because one of the major reasons that we engage with this um, MOOC development, because it's the first time that Irish language and culture has been delivered out through this platform, was that there was a huge demand from a huge um, I suppose diaspora that the Irish language has and some other research that Crush Crusher is doing for his um, doctoral studies I think is really really important and one of the areas that we identified was this notion of the motivations for people to do it and I think that comes across um, in what we've termed here as humanistic learning and that it provided the MOOC opportunity provided a massive opportunity for learners across the globe who identified, who had some notion of their identity um, associated with Ireland. It was a really, really important context for them to come and to learn and to gather and to, I suppose, demonstrate how they felt their Irishness um, in some way. And that could have been just through, you know, um, engaging with other learners in the platform, but also by saying that they um, realizing um, a sense of self and a sense of place through the through the MOOC. So I think it's been a huge, it's been a huge learning for us. And the other part, and I think that Crutter has said about 
about more research. Some of the research that we're doing currently was looking through, because this was a series of MOOCs that we put together for Irish Language and Culture, is the serial MOOC learner and to see them move through. And I think that was one of the areas that we were really, really interested in. So that has provided us with a, um, a very rich sense of the experience gained within the MOOC um, and then moving forward and that gathering into not only being this one time, one sort of shop to learn, but to move on through, I think has been really, really important. But I understand that it's early with you with for some of you and very late for some of us but i think that's all i'd like to say at the moment unless there's any other questions that anybody would have yeah i find this quite moving <laughs> to be honest i mean i noticed a few things like the mooc platform giving participants like a sense of self a sense of place um so that was really Really interesting. I'm I'm looking forward to your future research on this. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank our you. next presenter, next presenter is um, Remy. Good evening, everyone, or good oh, morning, hi, or good afternoon. It's lovely to connect and see some familiar faces and old friends, uh, and it's great to connect with new colleagues and scholars. I just want to thank not only the editorial team for leading this effort, but everybody who's come together across the world to participate in this really consequential conversation. So just thank you so much. Um, my paper is about collaboration, and the title is Social Annotation Enabling Collaboration for Open Learning. I should mention that I'm an assistant professor at the University of Colorado in Denver, and for the last four or five years now, I've been involved in an open, global project that concerns conversations about educational equity topics. I'll talk a little bit more about that project in just a moment. But through that project and the activities that my colleagues and I have been engaged with for the last number of years, collaboration keeps scratching the back of my head. What does it mean? What does it look like? And is it ambiguous or concrete, particularly as a uh, reflection of what's happening in the open education space. So I think as many would know on this webinar call, the term open can be interpreted in many different ways. And there are, of course, many articles and many conversations that would say, well, open is this or open is that. And of course, we've already spoken some about the distinctions between OERs and OEPs. And so I was curious in a similar sense about how collaboration is defined or not, how collaboration is theoretically grounded in the open literature, or not, and how collaboration guides empirical research about how individuals who are engaged in open learning actually collaborate together, or if that term just might not fit. And so my entire paper is framed around providing a theoretical grounding of what collaboration might mean, and pairing that theoretical grounding with an empirical case study of what collaboration can actually look like in an open learning initiative. So that explains to some degree that, that opening provocative quote. I'll quickly run through the next few bullet points on the next slide, but I wanna say that this project is again grounded in a conceptual argument that we can understand collaboration as intersubjective meaning making. And I turned to a body of literature known as computer supported collaborative learning to essentially get some theoretical heft behind how we might understand what collaboration means because collaboration is not cooperation. Collaboration requires people to create a new substance. It requires a joint problem space. It requires shared vocabulary and also conflict and negotiation and inquiry and misunderstanding to generate ultimately new forms of knowledge and the epistemic practices that can be emergent from collaboration. And so I was very curious to see what that looks like again in an open learning context. I'll briefly mention then that that conceptual argument is grounded in an ongoing project and a case study of something called the marginal syllabus. The marginal syllabus was founded in 2016. And I'm going to just put the project website in our chat here in case you're curious. Over the last four and a half years now, it's grown into a global multi-stakeholder partnership from leading educational literacy organizations and professional learning organizations, as well as open access journals 
and other publishers to essentially curate conversations asynchronously primarily on people's own time in their own way around educational equity topics. In short, people read things together, people write together, people ask really critical questions about educational equity topics together, and they use that as a form of interest-driven professional learning. Again, you can learn more about the project there. I'd also say that this particular paper that I'm talking about today emerges from an ongoing um, set of research studies that I've been involved with from, uh, again, many collaborators from all kind of walks of scholarly life about the marginal syllabus. And I've put a link to our additional research in the chat as well. And it's great to see here that there was a special themed issue on CSCL a number of years ago. That's really helpful as well. So it's all to say that I turned to this project looking at how educators, again, read things together. They write together through a social annotation tool. They're doing this all publicly and openly. And I was curious about the knowledge construction practices that emerged from their work and how that might be understood as a form of open collaboration. Again, you can see some of the notes here about what that looks like. You can, of course, read about this in the paper. And I'll simply say that there were a number of collaborative, coordinated epistemic practices at a group level that I think data support show this is what collaboration can look like, doesn't have to, but can look like in an open learning environment. It's based upon interview data, it's based upon annotation data, um, a variety of analytic methods. Those epistemic practices are detailed, so again, you can enjoy the paper and learn more about that. Again, the links can connect you to related research and the project as a whole. I'll leave my comments there, but I hope that this paper serves as a model for other open researchers and open education practitioners to understand, and not only that, appreciate the value of conceptually grounded studies of what a particular OEP, like collaboration, can look like, and also what kinds of empirical investigations are possible when there's a very clear definition of what a singular OEP, like collaboration, allows for in regards to um, evidence-based research. So I'll leave that there. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now, or you can connect with me online at another time. Thanks so much, everyone, for being involved with this project. Thank you so much, Remy. Um, so I don't know if RS is promoting the uh, special issue now in the background, but we should definitely provide a link to your project, Marginal Syllabus, in our promotion. Um, it's great to hear from it. Um, I mean, learn more about it from you, you know. Um, fantastic uh, study. So thank you so much. Um, I think definitely uh, there needed to be something about collaborative learning because OAP, when we talk about OAP, um, we often, you know, sometimes people tend to think that collaboration is inherent to OEP, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. So it's great that you, um, you know, delve deeper into the subject. Um, so our next presenter, or is, was Remy the last one? Sorry, um, Evrim, of course, Dana and Evrim, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of um, this special issue and thank you so much for the editors and for everybody who contributed to this um, to this issue. So um, my name is Dana Azubi and I am a PhD student at Iowa State University and I co-authored this paper with um, Dr. Abram Baran. She's an associate professor at Iowa State University. She sends regards to everybody. She has a class now so she wasn't able to attend. So our paper uh, is entitled Affordances, Challenges and Impact of Open Pedagogy, uh, Examining Students' Voices. So as the title of the paper um, highlights, uh, we, uh, uh, we are talking basically in this paper about uh, implementing open pedagogy in higher education, um, uh, in higher education uh, uh, context. So uh, the, um, the quote that uh, I have here is, engaging students in open pedagogy requires a deep and critical understanding of OEP processes and outcomes in different learning uh, contexts. So as we all know, like, and as we uh, have been hearing that there is um, uh, an increasing interest in OERs and OEPs. However, the literature has, uh, has um, mentioned and highlighted significantly that there is a need to address um, open OEPs in teaching and learning contexts and to see how uh, are they implemented and integrated in uh, in, um, in creating teaching and learning resources where students are taking part of that. 
So open pedagogy um, emerges as a manifestation of an o OEP, and uh, over here we, we uh, have it in this uh, research as a dimension of OEP. So can you please move to the second slide? So uh, in this um, in this research, we uh, tried to address the critical need of uh, having uh, having uh, some uh, pedagogy and a robust pedagogy that can include diverse learning groups and uh, how how to successfully implement OEPs in higher educational contexts. Now, uh, according to the literature, there has not been any empirically tested models uh, for uh, implementing open pedagogy in higher education contexts. So uh, this study addressed this need uh, to develop and conceptualize open pedagogy models in higher education contexts. So in this study, we had uh, we had three different higher education uh, uh, contexts. We had an online context, a blended context, and a face-to-face -face context. And in all three of them, we implemented open pedagogy where students were engaging in open practices in order to develop OERs. Now, for for each class, there was a different um, a different outcome of this OER. So, in one class, for example, it was a wiki book. In another, it was a press book, and a third, it was online modules. But in all three classes, there was a certain um, a structure where we had like uh, similar. Uh, workshops done for students in order to learn more about what OERs are and what are the open licenses, how to uh, uh, how how to uh, go through the copyright issues and like what's the value of OERs and all the practices that would lead uh, them to creating the OER. Uh, we did various workshops. We uh, we had them um, do uh, specific like um, uh, specific phases, and we have in our paper a framework for all the phases that they went through in the renewable assignment. And then we asked them, um, we interviewed students, and we uh, had them uh, write reflections about their experience with creating the OERs and their experience with engaging in open pedagogy. So according to their experiences and uh, the highlighted affordances and challenges, we uh, presented this model. And this model is um, open pedagogy in action. So we hope that uh, other higher education contexts that wish to implement open pedagogy would, uh, would, uh, would be using this model in order to integrate, uh, integrate these practices in, uh, in uh, engaging students in the open pedagogy practices. So in this model, uh, we have five uh, basic uh, themes, and these themes are content curation, peer feedback, community engagement, development, and reflection. And within all these themes, there is a scaffolding that was uh, always uh, resonating within each and every practice. So we talk more about each and every um, uh, one of those themes, and then we talk more about uh, the affordances and the challenges that students um, had uh, during these experiences while creating their, their OERs. Uh, can we please move to the second one? Okay, so also there was a very important um, thing that uh, that we uh, we examined through this paper, which was what was the impact of these uh, practices. And uh, it, there were two basically uh, very uh, important things that were highlighted. Oh, the first thing was open access, uh, the, uh, the knowledge about open access and their awareness about the ethical issues, the integrity, the trust, the copyright, and their uh, their uh, perceptions and their uh, what they knew more about the socioeconomic impact of the open um, uh, access and the open um, and, uh, open knowledge while uh, while going through the open pedagogy uh, practices and they also highlighted a lot that they had a higher sense of agency where they felt that they were they had power and they had the choice and they had they felt responsible to uh, to promote their own work in um in um an open environment so um however like we uh we want to uh to also uh, like highlight the idea that oep doesn't really have to be meaningful all the time like engaging in those open practices doesn't always have to be uh, meaningful to, to students there were many conversations around 
why would I be uh, part of um, something that would be free while others are selling or are like publishing with uh, costs uh, uh, some of their uh, work? So students had these conversations and there was a lot of uh, talk about how OEP can contribute to the openness and to the equal access and affordability of resources. Uh, also, we would like to highlight uh, like uh, as for future uh, research and for future movements that there's a critical need to have conversation between uh, instructors and practitioners because in higher education because we need to engage students in OEP while, ha while ensuring that there is inclusive and collaborative learning environment within, uh, within that uh, uh, engagement. And we hope that you would read the, the article and you'd find it interesting. Thank you so much, Dana. This was really interesting. I think that's the end of our uh, presentations. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> so maybe at this point I can stop sharing my screen. Yes. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, maybe we can stop the recording now and just have an informal